Dr. Woodley, is what is a commonly missed warning sign that my dog may be struggling with gut health issues? Mm, This is a great question. And one of the biggest symptoms that I see that's directly related to gut health would be itchiness or allergies. Okay. Um, Is it normal for my dog to have loose or watery stool fairly regularly? 100% no. This is a great indicator gut health is off. And I always say, think about yourself. Like, would it be okay for us to have loose watery stool all the time, be uncomfortable. It could impact our daily life experience. And it's the same with our pets. It's an indicator that something's going on that we need to dive deeper into. And how important in your opinion is gut health to my dog's longevity? This is the key to your dog experiencing the longest possible life. And one of the crazy statistics is, is that there's estimated a hundred trillion microbial cells present in the intestine. And there's up to 10 times the number of mammalian cells in the body. So 10 times the microbes versus the cells. That's how important it is in driving the immune system, the rest of the body, how we're digesting, absorbing food. So this is a key component if you want your dogs to have longevity in their life. That's powerful. So for those of you watching now that I have your attention with these these really exciting topics, um, we're going to deep dive into those. But first, I must spend a couple seconds talking about Dr. Katie Woodley, who I have here with us today, who is an integrative holistic veterinarian who also uses pet acupuncture, uh, nutrition, as well as holistic practices in her current platforms. Um, she also, her website is natural, the natural pet doctor, which all of that will be linked down below where she has, uh, endless amounts of resources for you, even beyond gut health, but gut health, I know is a big passion for her and one of her uh, top expertise. And so I really hope and encourage you to check her out after you watch this. So let's go ahead and deep dive into it. As always, I always put a disclaimer in all of my content that this content is not meant to treat, prescribe, diagnose, always work with your local veterinarian. Um, this the intention of this is to share resources, research, and Dr. Woodley's expertise and her experience, real world experience in working with pets that are suffering from uh, gut health issues and what has really worked for her patients. So uh, uh, let's jump into why does, and you kind of touched on this, but why does gut health matter in our dogs? Why should we be concerned about this? Yeah. So this is a newer field of study, especially coming from the the human side within like the past 12 years. And, you know, when we think about like, that seems like a long time. However, studies right now, we're kind of like 20 years behind when we start looking at the research, but it's a newer field. And what we've realized is that everything is essentially being controlled by the microbiome. And so when I talk about microbiome, it's essentially the trillions of different types of microorganisms in the gut. So whether it's bacteria, fungi, protozoa, yeast also make up this entire ecosystem. So the gut's not just about digesting and absorbing food. It's about, okay, yes, that's an important component, but these microbes are also producing things like neurotransmitters. So like serotonin, 90% of serotonin, really essential for like that gut brain, the behavior side of our pets. And then also too, it's producing other hormones, vitamin D, B12 is being produced by these microbes, but also there's about 70% of the immune system that's closely connected with the gut. So this is where that integrative approach where everything is all interconnected. It's not just about the gut by itself, but now taking that broader integrative approach where everything is interconnected is key to making sure that we're healing disease or preventing it in the first place. So those microbes are interacting and actually modulating the immune system in our dogs. And they're also, so they're speaking directly to them. They're also connected to that central nervous system. So that gut brain access, there's a direct connection through the vagus nerve. So if you've ever felt like, I always refer to, you know, our personal experiences, like the butterflies in the stomach, right? You get excited and you feel it in your gut or you feel this gut response or you get really, really nervous. And all of a sudden you now have an upset like gut and you have to go to the bathroom, right? You've got 
stool. That's that gut brain connection. And the exact same thing can happen with our dogs. So think about they go boarding, they like get nervous, they get stressed, and we end up with stress colitis. And we see diarrhea might happen right then, or it might be a delayed response. And so this entire system is really, really important. They're also protecting against pathogens. I see people asking about Giardia. So if your microbiome's off, the gut health is off in your dogs, they're more susceptible to things like E. coli, salmonella, Giardia, even things like Parvo. Mm -hmm. So it's essential that we're making sure that we're supporting an optimal gut health in our dogs. Yeah. And that's similar to humans as well. It's the same as humans. I mean, it's just as yep. important for our dogs and our cats. I know you've done um, similar lives with our friends, the two crazy cat ladies uh, on cats as well. But I think that that parallel is is really interesting. And one thing you mentioned, which maybe we can kind of tan go tangent on that a little bit later, is the behavior side of it. Because I have actually seen, you know, with, with all of the rescue and foster dogs I bring in, a incredible transformation of behavior, whether it's a little bit more, they're, they're a little bit more reactive or nervous or anxious when all I do is maybe change their diet. I find, um, I find a huge difference. So it's really, I really am excited to hear more of your thoughts on that. Um, and I agree with you wholeheartedly that, that gut health is, is powerful, especially as you said before, for uh, longevity. Uh, so what are some common uh, GI system, GI upset uh, symptoms that people might be seeing in their dogs? Maybe they don't even realize are tied to poor gut health. Yeah, this is a great question. And obviously this, the obvious ones, right? Diarrhea, vomiting, loose stool. Mm -hmm. Also too, if your pet's really sensitive to different foods. So say you feed your dog like a new treat or a new diet and they end up with diarrhea. That can be a sign gut health is off. But then we have the ones that are commonly missed and they're directly also connected to gut health. So I alluded to it at the beginning. So allergies. So if you have a, a dog chewing at his feet all the time, uh, chewing, getting hot spots, ear infections, that's directly connected. Remember that immune system is part of gut health. And then also to anal glands. But there's a lot of studies now that show things like pancreatitis kidney mm -hmm. disease, diabetes, heart disease. So I want for everyone here to realize, like if your pet's experiencing a health issue, we need to look at the gut if your vet hasn't looked at gut health, because there's a lot we can do to support it through food, supplementation, there's fecal transplants, there's a lot of great ways that we can help our dogs. And that's going to make it a lot easier to manage those diseases. Yeah. And I think what's, what's interesting, um, as you alluded before, is that when we think about, uh, gut health, it's really a holistic, it's not just, we're looking at one aspect of the animal and how do we address that from what I understand, how you're explaining it is it's kind of this whole body outlook and it impacts everything. It impacts the immunity, like we said, longevity, and it can present in a variety of different ways. And I love, love, love the fact that you brought up uh, brought this up, which is if, cause I hear this all the time that, oh, my dog can only eat this bag of food. Otherwise they're going to have loose stool or gas or upset stomach, or I can never give new treats or every, whatever. Anytime I feed something new, my dog gets a stomach upset. And to me, my understanding is that is typically and often indicative of poor gut health. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So when we think about our pets, eating a wide variety of foods. Um, and this is essential, right? We shouldn't be eating the same food. I talk about this. If we were eating like a salad every single meal every day, right? That salad itself is healthy. But if we were to eat the same thing every single day, we can end up with nutritional deficiencies. So variety is the key to life for all species. And this is really important for dogs where if you're finding your pets really sensitive and you're changing around the diet and you can't change the diet, well, we have to think about those microbes, those microbes that are part of that ecosystem in the gut, if they're off, so say we don't have diversity, that means we don't have a lot of strains of different types of bacteria, we may be lacking the type of bacteria that are needed to, to break down like proteins and digest them. The other thing too, is there's certain types of strains of bacteria that are going to produce what we call like postbiotics. So these are the things that are like, they're going to 
produce short chain fatty acids that are feeding the, the intestinal cells, the lining of the gut. They're also producing those hormones, those neurotransmitters, those, so those B vitamins, vitamin D, serotonin, all sorts of different things. But there's also certain strains that also produce what we call bile acids and or secondary bile acids. These are the things that are gonna help with toxins. They're detergents, they're breaking down the fats and they're also digesting the food. A lot of dogs are deficient in these types of strains. And so we end up seeing loose stool. And this is where bringing it back to, okay, well, why are they sensitive? And it's typically because we have this dysbiosis. We have an imbalance of good versus bad bacteria. They're not able to process that different type of food or say like a higher fat meal higher protein meal. Uh, you know, this is where I see, you know, pet parents want to change over to a raw food diet from kibble and they do a fast transition and the dog ends up with like bloody diarrhea. They end up in the ER and then they're like, I can't feed a raw diet, but we actually need to manipulate and change that microbiome so that they can actually digest that food because we went from a really high carbohydrate kibble to a really high protein uh, diet. And those microbes weren't adjusted and that can lead to those symptoms of sensitivity that you're seeing in your dog. So we can manipulate the microbiome through different diet changes, a slower transition, supporting it with, you know, probiotics um, and get them to a place. So just because your pet's sensitive, it doesn't mean your dog will never be able to transition over. There's things that we can do, but it typically comes down to what microbes are present and do we have an excess of bad bacteria versus good? Yeah, I think that's, very well said. And it's again, similar to us as humans in that if all we ever ate was fortified cereal for the rest of the for, for, for years, 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 years. yeah, Cheerios, right? <laughs> for, for, for so many years. And then all of a sudden we introduce a salad with fresh leafy greens and fruit and avocado and healthy meats. We're probably going to experience some GI upset as well, because you're taking a overly ultra processed food, like a cereal or a dry kibble. Um, and then you're introducing real living foods as you alluded to. So of course you might experience some GI upset. So I, I like that you kind of spoke about that transition and, and going slowly and gradually and using other tools, which we'll talk about in a moment of how to, um, to help support that, that transition. So, um, so let's, so let's talk about that. I, I do, I'm really curious though, before we jump into, um, before we jump into what are some of the things to consider or processes to potentially follow if our dog is suffering from GI issues, but of your I'm curious of your thoughts on these, um, very limited ingredient, uh, we'll call them prescribed foods that are just basically corn filler, gluten, hydrolyzed protein, and, and people that will come to me and say, Hey, like I'm feeding this food that my vet recommended. And, um, and they're, we're having chronic loose stool, but now all of a sudden they're, they're doing fine. My concern with that, and I would love to hear your thoughts is, yeah, but what about the nutrient void that food probably is? And it doesn't have the variety like you discussed. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of a tough conversation to have with somebody that they're finally getting a resolution with the chronic stool or bloody stool. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, this is this is a controversial subject, right? Like the prescription diets, which I love taking on. So yeah. but it's, it's I didn't important. warn you either. I just came to my mind. <laughs> no, and I'm like, we got to go there. It's perfect. Okay. And it's one of those things where, you know, of course, quality of life is always most important. However, there's a lot we can do because we use a lot of food therapy and fresh food diets, where we can actually create some of these similar diets. The, the concern I have with them is that just like you stated, Rachel, there's a lot of issues with the quality of those ingredients. I mean, I don't think we have time to go into like human grade versus feed grade and the differences in quality that is present in those foods. We're going to have a lot of extra chemicals and inflammatory ingredients too. So short term, it seems like it's helping your pet, but long term, we have a lot of synthetic vitamins and minerals. We're feeding corn, gluten meal wheat products. And essentially what we can do is we can create an elimination diet to help heal that microbiome and get true resolution without creating vitamin mineral deficiencies. The other problems with these prescription diets and a lot of kibble foods too, is that those ingredients are also the highest source of things like herbicides, like Roundup and glyphosate. 
And so what that means is for people that don't understand what those are, I mean, herbicides are a huge problem, especially Roundup, so glyphosate. And a lot of people will come to me and say that these are safe and okay to use. However, the problem is, is that the research that they showed is that it directly impacts what we call the shikimate pathway. So just a little technicality here. So the shikimate pathway is what is actually, this is how it works on when it's sprayed on crops. So it's used on these types of crops for harvesting. So right before they're harvested, they spray glyphosate on the crops and it makes it dries them out so they can harvest them faster. So it's working specifically on this pathway that's affecting the protein levels. Um, so it's blocking proteins from being made. So that way the plant dies. And when they looked at will this impact human health, our cells don't have a shikimate pathway. The problem is, is that our microbes do. And so when we think about what is that pathway doing, it's enabling those microbes to take the food that we're feeding them and break it down into amino acids, which are essential for protein production. And so we're essentially creating this huge issue, killing our microbes. So we're creating a sterile gut. And so for feeding foods that are high in glyphosate, we have numerous research, research studies, uh, HRI labs, um, has done studies to showcase that pets that are fed these types of diets have really high levels of glyphosate in them compared to pets that are on a fresh food or raw food diet. So there's a lot of different reasons to not feed prescription foods. So if your dog is currently on one, I don't want you to get worried or stressed because this is just to increase awareness, right? Okay, there's there's other diets that you can transition to. There are other tools that we'll talk about that you can support and heal that gut. So that way you can create strength. So you can start transitioning them back onto a less processed diet that has better nutrients, less inflammatory ingredients, and is really going to support once again, that longevity of your dog. Love it. I couldn't agree more. And I think one thing that is uh, not spoken about a lot is that generally speaking, these prescription foods the intention, the original attention, intention was to have the dog on them for a limited period of time and yep. then to transition off. But I think some of us get stuck in this. This is the only thing that's worked for my dog, so I'm going to stay on it. So this yep. is a great segue into uh, what are some of the processes and things that we can do as pet parents when we really believe that our dog is struggling with some of the some gut health issues and dysbiosis. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm a big fan of testing and understanding like what's going on too. Um, you know, so of course, we'll talk about some of the things you can do to transition. But if you're able to test the microbiome, 100% do testing, mm -hmm. if you can, um, you can go through your veterinarian, there are like dysbiosis indexes that you can have them do um, to take a look at is that microbiome off? Do we have dysbiosis? There's also stool tests that a lot of pet parents across the world, not just US or Canada, can access. So testing like animal biome is one of the current companies at the time of this recording um, that can actually show you what's going on. Do we have higher levels of clostridium, E. coli? What's the diversity? Um, are we lacking strains? Um, so that's going to give you a better idea and also a more realistic expectation of the time frame of healing that needs to occur. Because I find that we get so stuck into immediate results. We expect immediate results. If something's not working within like a day or two, it's not working. And when we have these chronic health conditions, because, you know, our pets can be born with a microbiome imbalance, um, you know, depending on the food, these rescues you mentioned too, like they're not fed good quality foods or scavenging. There's a lot of stress that can also create imbalances. We have to have that realistic expectation of the time that it's gonna to take to heal. So I always say it's a journey. So keep that in mind as you're going through this journey of healing your pet's gut, because it does take time and there's going to be some ups and downs. So just because you have a down where you're seeing a little bit of loose stool or gassiness, it doesn't mean that you're not in the right direction. So one of the ways that I, that I teach pet parents when I work with them is keep a journal because you wanna see, are we having less frequency of in, like symptoms or is my dog recovering faster? And those are key indicators that you're on the right path. Um, so that's a way to look at it, you know, objectively versus subjectively, because when we're in that situation where we have loose stool, it can be really frustrating and hard. Um, so some of the ways to go back to your original question in terms of like, it was supporting the gut, right? Transitioning over. 
Yeah. Um, okay. So let's say if we're going from a kibble diet, right? A highly processed kibble diet. And we're looking at, and say you're on a prescription food. Once again, testing would be number one, if you can, if you can't do testing for whatever reason, this is where I'd be looking at, can we do an elimination diet? And that would mean in terms of like picking a novel protein where we're looking at a protein that our pets most likely never had. This can be a little bit harder because some proteins can be found and, you know, we don't know all the proteins in processed foods because of the rendering process. But ideally, like rabbit is a pretty good one, a pretty like it's a safer one that you can pick if you can access rabbit, um, even if you pick like venison or something, something that most likely they've never had. And then you can always do or cod cod, rabbit, do an elimination diet with like some sweet potato or even squash to calm down the gut and transition over. So I would do that for about two weeks. It's not a balanced diet. This is not a long-term diet for your dogs. It's to essentially create calmness and help eliminate a lot of these antigens, inflammatory ingredients in the gut. At the same time, I use things like your bone broths, Bone broths are very soothing to the gut. They contain a lot of glycine, collagen, um, so amino acids to help heal and repair. And a good way to think about like, so food therapy. So all food has energetics. If you have a dog that tends to run hot, where you're like, they have allergies or hot spots or always panting, don't use chicken like bone broth. Use something that's cooling, like a turkey, which is cooling, or a beef, which is going to be more neutral. So if you have a dog that runs cold, like an older dog, geriatric animals, where they're always laying in the sun, they don't do well in wintertime, this is when you can use those warming broths, so chicken broth. Once again, you can combine it with that bland elimination diet and then see how they do. Um, so that's going to kind of reset the gut and get them ready for the next phase. And then in terms of creating a balanced diet, this depends on like a lot of people too. They don't want to create these diets, right? They're yeah. like, that's why we pick, we're picking kibble in the first place. It's easier. Um, I don't want to necessarily do that. So with this reset with your gut, the dog's gut, you could always go to a lesser processed food. And a lot of times these dogs do really well with it because we're giving them non-synthetic vitamins and minerals. We're giving them fresh food and it's actually feeling, feeding that microbiome. So this could be either a freeze-dried diet. It could be a lightly cooked diet. Um, I find lightly cooked diets are a great transition, um, a pre-made. Um, so you don't have to make it. You don't have to worry about balancing it long-term. Um, and there's a lot of great brands out there looking for, if you can, and you can afford it, a human grade labeled option um, to help them and like reduce the amount of inflammatory ingredients that are in there. Um, so those would be a couple ways if you don't want to cook for them versus if you want to use a pre-made, we have a lot of great pre-made options available now. Yeah. So it sounds like uh, step one, get testing, of course, if possible. And uh, I've used Animal Biome. It's great. They have a great yeah. support system. Uh, and then second step is this elimination diet. And really, I think what you're saying is find, like if you're feeding a kibble, find one that's really limited ingredients and a, a novel or new to your dog protein, like uh, venison or rabbit. So to summarize yeah. that. And then from there, you're saying once they've been on that for maybe a week up to two weeks or so, temporary amount of time, then to slowly try to transition to a bit of a fresher or less processed food as kind of the next step to kind of help introduce some of the more live, healthy microbiome in, into the diet. Is that kind of a good summary? Yeah, I would say you're, if you're going to use like a limited ingredient diet for like the one to two weeks, if you can do a fresh food, like cooked for like doing it yourself with like two ingredients, that's going to be, be better than using if your dog has like GI issues where they're having symptoms, um, just because you're going to lower the burden of the like the gut having to process foods. So that'll be greatly helpful. And then you can go on to some of these pre made or other food options that might be easier to use long term. Yeah. And then for those of you watching, because I know some people watching are, are very, very new to this world and some are a little bit more advanced. And um, when Dr. Woodley says things like pre made, I saw somebody in one of the comments over here, they're like, what does that mean? And so 
what she's referring to is when you go to your local independent pet store um, or some veterinarian holistic integrative veterinarian offices will have um, freezers as well. But when you go to your local pet shop, again, not like a Petco or PetSmart, yeah. you you will see a freezer section in most of them. And you'll see options for uh, frozen foods. And these frozen foods can be gently cooked. Um, you can also, some of them deliver too online yeah. now. That's growing in popularity. Um, or you can get uh, raw, which is basically um, like almost like raw fro frozen hamburger patties that are complete and balanced for your dog that are pre-made. So you don't have to go and source the organ meat and the muscle meat and the different produce to make a complete and balanced diet. It's, it's all done for you. Um, so that's what we mean by pre-made. Okay. So now we're at this step of we're starting to feed uh, a complete and balanced pre-made, let's say gently cooked food. What, you know, what, what would be next steps like adding in a probiotic, uh, prebiotic digestive enzymes? What are some things that you recommend from here? Yeah. So it'll depend on your symptoms, right? So if we're seeing like gassiness or bloating, especially after the pet eats, this can be a sign that your dog doesn't have enough digestive enzymes. So when we feed a highly processed food, so we're referring to like a kibble diet, um, that's going to potentially increase the stomach pH. So that pH is a little bit higher than what it would be if say they're eating a higher protein diet. What happens is, and the problem with this is, is that it doesn't activate the pancreas in the same way to stimulate normal digestive enzymes. So those di digestive enzymes are necessary for breaking down proteins, fats, carbohydrates. So, right, these are those macronutrients that are really important, but we need to break them down to really get those vitamins, minerals, the phytonutrients, the antioxidants from the food. That's what's going to feed our cells and help us achieve optimal health. Health. So if we don't have digestive enzymes, we can't break down the food. And then we're essentially just pooping out the, the food. So we want to break that down. Um, so this is where if you're seeing a, your pet gets more gassy, grumbly, you know, that rumbling, you can hear their stomach, or they're experiencing like where they vomit up their food right after eating. This is where adding in a digestive enzyme can be really powerful and beneficial to helping them. If you have to feed a processed food diet too, or a kibble diet, I always recommend doing a digestive enzyme regardless because of that pH change. So it's not going to necessarily harm them, which is great. It's a very safe supplement. And I always say too, when you start a new supplement, keep that journal so you can track how does my pet feel? What does their stool look like? What is their energy level when we're adding in something new? So digestive enzymes can be very powerful and helpful, especially if your pet has, is prone to things like pancreatitis too, where that pancreas is inflamed. It's not working as well as it should. It's probably not going to be producing as those digestive enzymes as well as it should. So we want to give it a break and help it out. So digestive enzymes are really helpful. I like using fresh foods for prebiotics. So when we talk about prebiotics, what we're talking about is these, this is the fiber the, this is the source of food for the, the beneficial bacteria. So in that microbiome we've been talking about, they need a food source or else they're going to starve, they're going to die, and then they're not going to be able to do their job that's so important for the rest of the body. So we need to provide a food source. So fiber is something that we actually don't utilize. It's specifically for those microbes, and it's the same for our pets. So different like prebiotics, you'll see this on supplements, like probiotics should have a prebiotic. So probiotics are beneficial bacteria. So when you look at the ingredient list or the label, you'll see things like lactobacillus, bifidobacterium. Those are really common probiotics, but they need a, so they need a food source. So this would be things like inulin, larcharabinogalactin. You'll see MOS, your mono oligosaccharides. You'll sometimes see FOS, fructo oligosaccharides. Those are the fiber sources to feed those bacteria. But the, the fun thing is, and the nice thing that I like using fresh food is, is it tends to be cheaper. And also too, we get the phytonutrients and the antioxidants from fresh food. So the prebiotics that we can use as like superfood toppers to our pet's food, especially if we have to feed like a, a more processed food, but we can use this for whether or not we're feeding a fresh food diet or for feeding a kibble diet is we can use things like mushrooms. 
medicinal mushrooms. So these are things like just even basic button mushrooms that you can get from the grocery store and you can lightly cook them. You can cook them in a little bit of ghee or grass fed butter, and you can put a little bit on your dog's food. That's a prebiotic. So is asparagus. So once again, lightly cooked, lightly cooked will help break it down, make it easier to digest. Um, so those are just great sources of prebiotics, even using some fruits like your apple can be really helpful if your pet's prone to like acid reflux where they're bringing up that bile, they're vomiting up bile before they eat. Um, that's a good source of a soothing prebiotic for them. Um, so those are a couple options. You can use a, a you know, a brand like a supplement or you can co complement the food with a natural prebiotic option too. Um, so, uh, you know, start with digestive enzymes to help break down that food, especially if we are feeding a processed food diet, but also look at adding in some of these fresh food options to feed the good bacteria so that microbiome has a food source to help it flourish. I love that you spoke about cooking uh, the asparagus or lightly sauteing the mushrooms because it's it's become ever so popular, which I love um, on social media to add fresh food to the bowl, which I love. Like when you're feeding a, a ultra processed kibble, which all kibble is, so I guess that's redundant. But when you're feeding a kibble, you um, there's this trend to add fresh to the bowl. Something I'm really passionate about, and I'd love for you to I guess touch more on. Though I don't think there's maybe much more to even say on it. Is that it's great, you know, adding some blueberries or strawberries or some broccoli, broccolini on the bowl. But if you don't puree it, if you don't smash it or crush it, maybe mince or lightly saute or steam, your dog's not going to be able to digest or absorb as much of the nutrition, micro, macro, and prebiotics, um, vitamins and minerals from that produce if you don't do that. Um, do you, sounds like you do, but do you agree with that statement? And what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So our dogs are, they don't have the types of enzymes that we have. They have a little bit of amylase in their saliva to help break down like the carbohydrates and starches. But this is why, you know, dog parents, you know, pet parents in general will say, oh, they're pooping out carrots. You know, I'm saying like a blueberry come out whole. So we have to help them process it. So whether that's lightly cooking it, you know, I think for a lot of your cruciferous vegetables, it's easier to digest, especially if they have a gut health issue, if we are steaming them and then blending them. And sometimes too, dogs will be like, what is this, this texture? I don't know what this fresh food is. And then they avoid it. And we just assume that they just, they don't eat their vegetables, but there's different ways to incorporate it. So blending it, cooking it, lightly cooking it. We don't want to cook out all the nutrients, remember? So lightly steaming or a little bit of lightly sauteing it will help break down what we call that cellulose, right? That plant cell wall to make it easier to digest. Because there's no point in buying the organic blueberries or carrots if your pet's going to just poop them out. So that'll make it easier for them to process. So 100% agree with that. Awesome. Um, okay, so tell me, are there any last steps for this kind of process of uh, feeding and um, a, more, a fresher food and then adding prebiotics in the form of whole foods you prefer, digestive enzymes, probiotics? Are there any last steps after that in terms of trying to heal our pet's gut that you'd, that you'd like to touch yeah. on? So remember, each dog is different. So there's so many different like gut health issues that we could be experiencing and different severities. You know, some pets that are really sensitive and have really damaged gut lining, you're going to have to move more slowly with them. This is where like raw goat milk can be very soothing and healing and providing nutrients and natural digestive enzymes can be really helpful for those pets and just in general. So keep that in mind when we're talking about this. It definitely is not a one size fits all, but it's a great kind of guideline where you can try this with your dogs and see how they respond to it. Um, if your pet does still have sense, this is where they're like sensitive or they're still experiencing GI issues. Um, once again, not changing around too much at the start is really important because we need to calm down that inflammation. We need to repopulate the gut and get things really well regulated in there. And then once you've been consistent with like the stools more solid, they're less burpy, they're less gassy, then that's when you can start adding in different foods one at a time. 
I always space things out usually between three to five days because that's the amount of time frame that I usually see takes before we see like a flare up. So if you're at that three day mark or the five day mark, depending on how bold you are with making changes, um, you know, every person's different, um, then you're usually good to add in a different type of food. Now, other things to have in your toolbox um, in terms of so it this is where like fiber content of food makes a huge difference for a lot of pets. So psyllium husk is good to have on hand in terms of being able to increase the amount of fiber, but not every dog does well with fiber. But if your dog has soft stool, try a little bit of psyllium husk to see if you can firm it up. Um, the other thing too, is I love having using like clays or activated charcoal for if you're experiencing severe GI upset, um, very safe to use activated charcoal, most people anywhere in the world can get. Um, so you can give them a little bit of activated charcoal to help absorb the toxins and clear that out. That is a short term thing that you would use. Um, so that can help. If you're finding you need to help heal the gut lining, slippery elm is really soothing. So that's just another great one. I love using teas. And I know I'm throwing a lot at you right now. So I would pick one or two things, stick with that, see how your dog responds and then move on. You don't need to use all these things, starting with one thing, changing the diet, less processed, digestive enzymes, making sure we have a prebiotic source, and then we're healing the gut lining. So this would be slippery elm, soothing it, calming it down, uh, using marshmallow tea, if you, you know, if you can get an organic tea, adding that into the food, also a mucilage, very soothing, and just see how your dog does. Um, obviously there's other things we can do if we need to, but that's a great starting place. And also too, these supplements, I recommend every single dog, like parent have at home to have on hand, because we can use them in acute situations, or we can use them in situations where we're just looking to heal the gut lining. Yeah. Uh, another one that I've, I've used has been pumpkin, but what's interesting yes. is I have, and just plain pure pumpkin puree is I have one dog that actually doesn't do it. It'll actually cause him to have a little bit more loose stool and then it bulks up my other dog's stool. So I think it's interesting. It can, it can do both. Um, and another thing I'm get your thoughts on this, that, um, my, my, my doodle mix, um, he likes to counter surf. And so yeah. <laughs> I know that's, it's, it, he gets into trouble sometimes, but he got into muffins. And so he was having loose stool. I knew it wasn't toxic enough to, to rush him to the vet. Uh, but I just, uh, I fasted him for 24 hours and then I just gave him, um, raw meaty bones like chicken wings, um, duck necks, because I, for him, at least I find that the raw, again, never cooked bones, but I find that the raw, the meaty bones, the more soft pliable bones in for temporarily a little bit higher uh, content and just fed him that for a day. One, he loved it. Um, but two, the bone kind of helped bulk up his stool. What are your thoughts on that? As a yeah. kind of boot? calcium is constant, too much calcium is constipating. Yeah. So that's where also too, when we switch over to a raw food diet, sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll see the stools get smaller for one, because there's less, um, you know, fiber content and, uh, less byproduct coming out into the stool, but definitely that's a great option. Um, you know, if you're concerned with feeding that type of thing, I know a lot of yeah. uh, dog parents are like, Oh my gosh, what if they swallow it? We're feeding a raw food. You know, there's other ways to do this, but that's definitely a great safe option. Um, acute situations, 12 to 24 hours of like a bone broth or water, and then adding in, um, you know, Saccharomyces boulardii is another great option. It's a beneficial yeast that has a lot of research behind it to help firm up the stool and it modulates that microbiome and the immune system. Um, so those are some other things, but yeah, hundred percent. I have nothing against with like feeding those raw turkey necks. And then they, what's nice too, is they have something to chew on. So they feel like they're getting, cause you're usually feeding, you should be feeding less food to like rest the gut, not full of like meals. So they feel like they have something right. Cause it can be really hard when they're looking at you, like where's my main meal. So now you're giving them something else that can help soothe their gut too. On that note, what are your thoughts or opinions on fasting with dogs? Oh, they're made for it. <laughs> so yeah, I was like, I didn't have to say made for fasting. Yeah. Cats, no. Right. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. But dogs, yes. So this is where a 12 to 24 hour fast is key to helping calm the gut. 
our, our dogs don't realize like they shouldn't be eating a lot of times if they're still energetic, obviously, if they're really lethargic and not doing well, you need to go to the vet. This is not the time and place to play around with some of these recommendations. But if they're still energetic, they're still happy, they're just having a like diarrhea and some GI upset, like they don't understand like that they shouldn't eat their meal. Like we know we're like, oh, I feel gurgly. I don't feel good. I don't want to eat my dinner tonight. Like I'm going to fast or I'm going to eat like chicken noodle soup, right? Because yeah. we're eating like broth. And so this is where fasting is really helpful. I find too, like freezing uh, bone broth can be helpful. So you can give them like the cubes of the bone broth. So they feel like they're getting something to chew on and eat can be beneficial also. But yeah, 12 to 24 hour fast, 100%. I am a big fan of, and it can clear up the diarrhea pretty quickly because we're just allowing that gut to rest and cleanse and clear the toxins out. Yeah. Um, I definitely find it was hard at first, you know, to, to do that with my dog. Cause I try to fast them I was, honestly, probably once every other week, just for optimal health. And then I've switched my senior. I actually feed uh, twice a day. Now he just seems to do better with that. But my, I don't know, we call middle age boy. <laughs> he, um, he's only five. So he, he still acts like a puppy, but I only feed him once a day on average. And uh, he does great with that. It was a hard transition, but I find um, just general, he just has even more energy. So I don't, I don't know if that's a good thing. Um, but he, you know, he came from questionable backgrounds and I, he was having chronic loose stool and just that alone, obviously in feeding a fresh food diet uh, seemed to be helpful for him. Yeah. Um, so I guess um, my next question is about probiotics and my understanding with those, they make me a little nervous because I feel like they're over-marketed in, in many situations. And I'm also, I'm not an expert on them, but my understanding is that you can give the wrong kind and just make things worse, or you can just give too much and you're either mm -hmm. wasting money, like you said, because you're not giving a prebiotic or you're just giving the wrong strand. So it can actually make them sick. What, what, some, what are some tips you have for us to navigate, navigate yeah. that? Probiotics are way overused, to be honest. Um, the other thing too, is a lot of probiotics on the market are actually dead. Right. So they're not even live. So we're, we're essentially feeding nothing to the pet. You're wasting money. Um, it can help. Like there is a time and a place like I've seen where probiotics can make a huge difference, like Saccharomyces can be helpful, but also to making sure that we're using brands that are testing the, the product at the end of manufacturing. But the other thing too, that was really eye opening. Um, I actually have a client who is, he, he manufactured, he's one of the biggest pet supplement manufacturers in the U S he owns the company. So he, we had a very interesting conversation about supplements in general and especially probiotics. And he, he gave me an analogy that made a whole lot of sense in terms of when you think about the probiotic, right? And you think about when they're stored in, for example, like Amazon, right? The warehouses aren't temperature regulated. So it can be really high heat, low, like, or very cold. And then they go, let's say it's summertime here and they go on a truck and it's super hot. What environment is that mimicking? It's like being in the gut. So they yeah. activate, they eat the prebiotics that are part of it. And essentially by the time it gets to you, there's nothing in there. So if they were alive anyways, at the start of the journey. So I think they're definitely overused. The other thing that I've seen a lot of issues with, and I'm sure uh, that parents here have experienced this if they've used probiotics and especially if their dogs have a gut health issue, mm -hmm. is that if we have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or what we call SIBO, so where we have this dysbiosis in the first part of the intestine, so right after the food comes out through the stomach and we have this overgrowth of bacteria, if we're putting probiotics in that have lactobacillus, bifidobacteria, um, ones that aren't encapsulated, like they're not spore encapsulated or soil-based probiotics, they can't pass through that. So it's essentially like putting fuel to the fire and we end up seeing worsening of symptoms. So this is where pets get worse. They vomit, they get diarrhea from that. They don't feel good. You might see like an increase in like itchiness. And that can be a sign that we have SIBO. Obviously, it's not a true diagnostic test, but I've seen it happen a lot. And so probiotics are not the, the end-all be-all. They can have a time and a place, 
but this is where we need to understand why are we using something? If we haven't optimized the diet in the first place, if we haven't helped with digestion, like adding in digestive enzymes, like those are the first steps that I would take anyways. We need to clean up the diet. We need to heal the gut lining. And we always, you know, I find that we have the best intentions, but this is where we end up with like a supplement graveyard where we're buying all the things because someone said that this was really good. And then we're just trying all this different stuff and we're forgetting about why we're using it. And probiotics fall into that. They're not always the first go to. They may be a part of the plan, but there's other things we need to clean up or remove first before we even go to a probiotic. I love that. And it's something that I've, I've been guilty of where, you oh, know, especially in the world. Yeah. When I'm like, oh, look at this new supplement, look, especially like with my experience having worked in the pet food industry, it, you know, I'm, I'm friends with people who have these new brands and these new products and these yep. veterinarians. And I, I'm like, I want to try all this. And I really had to take a step back and realize that supplements are just that they are meant to be supplemental to, as you said, which I think is so powerful to a proper, we'll call it species appropriate, biologically appropriate, optimal diet for our dogs. Uh, and, and then, as you said, like they can be added on one at a, at a time based on our dog's needs. But ultimately, ultimately my understanding and correct me if I'm wrong, that it, once we can heal the gut, uh, just feeding them a balanced species appropriate diet, ideally less processed, could and should be enough as long as we're feeding variety, maybe different types of proteins uh, as is. W would you agree with that? Yeah. And the other thing too is like going back to the testing, like if you do an animal biome test or you find there's dysbiosis, you can essentially use fecal transplant to help repopulate because now you're not taking one, two, three, or five strains of like beneficial bacteria. So there's no way there's trillions of different types of bacteria in the gut. There's no way those five strains can make that ecosystem healthy and balanced again. So we can get an unbalanced ecosystem. And there's some studies that have shown using certain probiotics during antibiotic treatment actually created a worse off microbiome at the end. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to use something, this is where I'd rather people go for a fecal transplant. That's the entire ecosystem that we're putting back in a healthy ecosystem we're putting back into that dog's gut but we can also use like fresh food so this is where once again like raw goat milk is like you can use it as a, just a food source like it's a balanced food source you could always add a little bit of kefir or a little bit of sauerkraut too so these are your fermented foods that are going to provide some natural digestive enzymes and also a lot of different types of bacteria I wouldn't feed a lot, right? We're going to create digestive upset, but yeah. these are really good options for your pets. Um, you know, Billy Hochman, who I'm mm -hmm. sure you've talked to, uh, Billy Hochman with Green Juju. I mean, we've done a lot of talks with him talking about, you know, your raw goat milk and how he's used that as a balanced diet for a lot of, a lot of his own dogs and a lot of dogs that he's um, mentored. So it's, it's one of those where I'd rather you use whole food sources, do the testing first before you even reach for probiotics. The other thing too, to be aware of that I find a lot of these probiotics on the market contain other ingredients in them. So one of the most commonly used ones contains di titanium dioxide on the label, and that is a known carcinogen. It will affect the DNA adversely in your pet long term. Long term, that's no good, right? That can lead to things like cancer. I can't say it causes cancer, but we don't want to be putting that into our pets. Uh, another really well-known probiotic that vets prescribe is also going to have your, your digest in it. And that's a rendered product. And I know you've done a lot of talks with other practitioners and specialists in the food industry. And rendered products are not what we want to be putting into our dogs if we want to achieve longevity long term. So, yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I, I couldn't say it better myself. So question, a little off topic, and then I'll get back on it because I know we're getting close to time. What are your thoughts on um, feeding our dogs? Because you talked about goat milk and kefir, kimchi, sauerkraut, I think are great uh, yogurts. It, it, it's a really, it's something that I've kind of opted away from because my understanding is it's, I mean, it's not necessarily harmful. And I know lactose in it, especially the Greek plain yogurts is pretty low, but it, it's pasteurized. So any yeah. bacteria that's advertised on it is 
negligible at best, in my opinion. But I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of it just because I treat so much gut health issues. Yeah. And like, so <laughs> I tend to see a lot of pets that are really, really sensitive. And I feel like we have all these other better options for them. Like, keep in mind, I said raw goat milk, not raw cow milk. And so this is where if I can, and I'm using colostrum, I'm using goat colostrum, um, just because our pets tend to do better with it, just like we tend to do better with yeah. goat's milk. And I know there's like A2 cows and things like that. Obviously, we're not going to go in depth on that. But honestly, if you have a dog that has a sensitive gut and you're looking to heal their gut, you know, I tend to stay away from dairy products unless we know that they can tolerate it. The other thing too, from a Chinese medicine perspective, dairy is what we call dampening. So dampness is like inflammation. So if we're already prone to dampness, that's going to be bloody stool, mucus in the stool. Those are all forms of dampness from a Chinese medicine perspective. We don't want to feed foods that are going to potentially create more of that. So just from a food therapy, energetic perspective too, I don't use a lot of dairy products unless, you know, there's a reason to, or we know that they tolerate it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you kind of share that sentiment uh, because uh, with your experience, you know, there's, there's very few people in, in my experience and professionals that have the de dedication to pet health uh, as you do in terms of gut health. So um, I definitely respect what you have to say on that. So a, a couple more quick questions. Let's say I'm looking, I, I'm going to feed a kibble in this scenario. Um, what are a couple red flag ingredients? If I'm going to pick a kibble that you're like, okay, that's great, but here's some ingredients in the kibble that I would really avoid if gut health is my priority. I think we talked about a couple, right? Like corn, gluten yeah. meal. Yep. I mean, your meals, your meat meals would be something. Yeah. Because whenever you see meal, it means that it's a rendered product. And it can also, a lot of these pets have food sensitivities. So when we think about gut health, I didn't touch on this. Um, what happens though, and the reason why we see like allergies is we end up getting inflammation. So the first step is dysbiosis. We have an imbalance of the good versus bad bacteria. Those create inflammatory mediators. It creates inflammation. Our gut lining, your dog's gut lining is one cell layer thick. That is all that is separating it from toxins, food, foreign substances in the lumen. And then we have the bloodstream down here and the immune system. And so if this gut lining gets, it gets inflamed, there's tight junctions. The cells should be like held together like this. They should be nice and tight. There's no separation. They start getting inflamed. We start seeing gaps and holes and food bacteria and toxins pass through. They get into the bloodstream. They stimulate the immune system. And that's why we see inflammation that's not directly related or seems like it to gut health, right? Itchy ears and ear infections. And so if we're feeding foods where, and also to, to go back to the food sensitivity aspect, that's where food sensitivities happen. We have leaky gut. Now the body's reacting to food and seeing it as a foreign substance and it's, you know, creating immunoglobulins and creating an adverse reaction. So if we're feeding a rendered product where essentially they're just taking all the carcasses and throwing them into the pit and grinding them up and heating them down and making a powder, that's what the meal is. So whether or not it says, you know, chicken meal, poultry meal, whatever it is, there's still, it's not it's not like an elimination diet trial, right? It's going to be like, well, there's probably a chicken thrown in there and there's probably a cow thrown in there because they have to get rid of those carcasses somehow. And that's unfortunately how the pet food industry works. Um, so I would definitely avoid any meal. I would also avoid byproduct meal. So similar things. These are they are rendered products. So you just don't know the source of it. The quality is questionable. It doesn't mean that all quality is bad. You just can't, you just don't know what the quality is. So if we have a gut health issue, we need to clean things up. We need to remove the inflammatory ingredients. Very important. Um, so those are a couple of things to look for. Um, the other thing that I hate, and I, I'm sure you've talked about it too, just because it's the marketing like scam is that, mm -hmm. you know, the 
the pet food industry is really good at marketing and not the best way, right? In terms of getting people to think they're feeding good quality foods is whenever you like, I always tell people to look for salt. So this is that salt rule. And when you see like fresh foods after salt, so you'll see like blueberries, cranberries is commonly added. That's going to be less than 1% of the ingredients. And right then and there, I start not trusting the company because I'm like, you're, you're tricking pet parents to think that this is a higher quality food too. So I don't like when companies do that because it makes me question what other things that are you doing where you're sliding things under the rug and hiding it and not being transparent about what's going into your pet food. Um, so those are a couple of things. Um, you know, Soy. Soy is probably soy, another one. Soy, yeah. soy is another huge one. Soy is definitely a big one. Um, I mean, if you can avoid owl foods, if you're not feeding organic. So owl foods are going to be your oats, your wheat, your legumes. Those are the most highly, they're the highly contaminated with your, your glyphosate. Um, so unless it says organic, you're going to have higher glyphosate. And once again, that's going to directly impact your microbiome. So those are a couple of things to be aware of. They can be really hard to avoid. But so. wait, but wait, don't, doesn't adding grains in food help with DCM? <laughs> we won't go uh, into that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole other topic. Oh, but. no. I think there's, to be honest, I think there's, there's a lot more. And I've seen other, um, Stephanie Seneff, who is a big, she talks about, she's a human scientist and talks about glyphosate. I'm um, talking about, I think there's more to how glyphosate is impacting the microbiome and that shikimot pathway leading to like DCM and, you know, all the, there's so many factors. It's not grains though. It's just absolutely ridiculous. There's so many other factors. Yeah. So confusing. That's why it's so confusing to be a pet parent, you know, at yeah. this time, there's so many misleading things. For sure. And that's why I love the fact that we have veterinarians like yourself who not only went through arguably one of the most challenging schooling experiences you could have underwent, but then you took your experiences, you went pun intended against the grain, uh, and now you're educating. I'd love to hear more a little bit about um, the, I hate to use the word services, but the resources you offer, because you have a whole online community um, where you support pet parents that are really dedicated. These are like 2.0 next level pet parents that are like all in, they're willing to do, make all their food if they had to, like whatever it took um, to help get their dog on the right track. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah. So what I found through the years is that a lot of people get stuck, you know, just like what we were talking about. They're not sure what those next steps are. A lot of times they have sick pets or they've just gone through a pet like a pet passed away and they want to do everything possible for those things to not happen again. And there's just not a whole lot of information out there piecing it together for them along with the support system. Um, so essentially what we've done is we've created a healthy holistic pet blueprint where we've created an online educational platform that takes you through the frameworks, why these areas are so important, how everything is interconnected from like physical health, emotional health, immune health, gut health, the environmental health, right? Like detoxification, when and how to do that properly and safely and broken it down to help them go through it and also provide the frameworks on like, we start here, the next steps are here. And then what we've also done is we have a private community where you can get support, feedback, you can ask questions as you're implementing that information and you're making those adjustments to your pet's life and their health and their lifestyle. And then we do weekly Q&As too. That way you can get further support. You're part of a really like-minded, safe community. I love how you said that at the start safe place to ask those questions because it can be really hard to go against the grain in the online space and not get, you know, the fury and fire from other people that disagree and may not understand why. And so we've essentially created a lifetime support, mentorship, educational program to help guide pet parents for their dogs and their cats throughout all life stages to really help them thrive naturally. And it's just been amazing working with people in that community and watching their pets flourish and come in with like really poor quality health and see them come through and experience optimal health now and just watch those changes. And then also see the changes that occur with like human health too, because they implement a lot of the things that we talk about. Yeah. I'm getting tired of that saying my dog eats better than me. And because oh. what I tell people is we should be eating better together because the yeah. the better you take care of yourself, 
the more you can do for your dog and you are your dog, your cat and your dogs, your whole world. So, um, I used, I used to say it as, as a joke because I did put more time and energy into taking care of my pets. And I realized that's, that's not what they would want and that's not what's optimal. So, yeah, um, I love to hear that you're seeing that, um, connection, the parallel between the two. Yeah. I always say you can't pour from an empty cup. Right. Yeah. And so I think it's, it's really neat and fascinating too, to see, people see the connections with their own health and there's little, it doesn't have to be a massive overhaul. That's the thing. Like, I think a lot of people get overwhelmed with all this information, like one tiny change. There's studies that show like even feeding a kibble diet, if you add fresh food on top, reduces the risk of cancer by like 60%. Like there's so much power and just a small change. And if that gives you confidence and helps you go forward, start with the one small thing. It doesn't have to be a massive overhaul and it will make a huge difference long-term for like your own health and your pet's health. Beautiful. Beautifully said. I will have the link to your community as well as you have blogs and a ton of resources all linked in the description below. I think I already have it there, but I'll make sure they're all there. And I also, I know you did well, we've done probably a few with the two crazy cat ladies on, on with gut health for cat pet parents, for cat yeah. parents. Um, so I'll link that below as well. So if you have a cat and you want to kind of do this journey with, do you have a lot of cat parents in your I do. As well? I attract a lot of cat parents, which is there great. I love it. Yes. They need support too. They definitely don't get enough uh, guidance and help. So yes, we do both dogs and cats. And, you know, there's a lot of rescues too and shelters and you know, pet trainers and people that work in a uh, healthy food store. It's just neat because the mission is to make sure people can share the info also and help guide people just like what you're doing with your mission, Rachel. It's so important, like helping to share the info so people feel empowered that they can take action. Yeah, that's it. it it's definitely at this point become my life, my life purpose. And I couldn't do it without individuals like yourself. So thank you for everything you do for pet parents for people like myself and for the animals of the world. I mean, we, you're, you're having a much larger impact than I think you realize. So I appreciate you being here today. I hope you can come back and we can do this again. And, um, thank you for everyone watching. Please make sure you go check the links below, um, to learn more and connect more with Dr. Woodley and her entire, um, mission and purpose towards pet health with an emphasis on gut health. Um, and thank you for watching.